you. And Dr. Club is also here, and this is her clinic. So everybody give a big thank you for everybody. I am honored to be here. For two reasons. I've known Susan for 30 years, maybe. I think I met you in 1978 when I graduated from vet yeah. school. Wow. Um, and I was working, I was doing an externship with Greg Harrison. Yeah. And you came in and you had just got back from St. Vincent or something. Yeah, I had been there with Ramon. Yeah. Um, it was yeah. 78. We had been to St. Vincent and St. Lucia to look at parrots in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, because it is early, it is a Sunday, and to get so many people out here, that's great. I think it shows that evil culture is not dead. Um, five years ago, we were in a crisis. Um, demand and interest in birds was declining, and we didn't know where it was going to go. Uh, many people bailed out, um, and then there's been a resurgence, and the resurgence is worldwide. Um, you now see massive amounts of birds being kept worldwide. Uh, there's a resurgency in Asia uh, and China with all its problems um, here and in Latin America. And I think part of our task has to be to educate. You don't put a chain on a parrot's leg um, that's 12 inches long and you don't feed it to sunflower seed. They require much more than that. And it's part of our task, all of our combined tasks, to educate these people. They don't understand, they don't know better. We were there 40 years ago. I still remember um, going to a pet store and being told, do you want to uh, you want to tether your bird, you want to chain? And I said, no, I don't want that. So we've come a long way, and part of that is diet. I think Susan will agree that uh, before pellet and diets, before some of these advances in dietary requirements, dietary related illnesses were a huge problem. So what I wanted to do is today to talk a little bit about diet, to explain the role that parrots play in their environment, and uh, to then answer any questions that you may have. So we'll get started. Um, um. Sorry about that, we'll just put, uh, I think we can just yeah. uh, Space Usually it's up and down, and everybody's laptop is different. Yeah, this one has like, let's see. There we go. So what role, where do you hit? Um, just go. Quick, all right. What role do parents play? Parents are very destructive. We know they waste a lot of food. <laughs> but we also have come to realize that they play a key role in their environment, and that where the parents disappear, the forest begins to degrade. Because as they eat food resources, they drop significant amounts. Here we see a black cockatoo in Australia with a hatia. Here we see a hyacinth macaw with a palm nut. So they drop seeds, the seeds sprout, and they maintain the forest. In Bolivia, where the blue throat of the call comes from, where the populations were trapped or where they crashed. And there's different takes as to why the populations drop. Uh, where those populations drop, the islands, the palm islands, began to disappear. Because there was nobody that would disperse the seeds. They would partially crack the seeds, the seeds would germinate, and the forest would come back. In other areas, the seeds go right through the digestive tract. We know that cactus, for example, in the habitat of the Lear's macaw, uh, the Lear's macaws actually transport cactus seeds. And a lot closer to home, in Miami, we have Brazilian pepper. Brazilian pepper is an invasive tree. The parrots eat the seeds, they drop some of them, and so they spread the Brazilian pepper. Now, parrots compete. They live in an environment full of other species, mammals, birds. So they have all this comp competition. They compete with toucans from fruit. They compete with bats and mammals and monkeys. So how do they avoid this competition? They harvest foods green. They eat things long before they ripen. The seeds, the fruits are mature, 
but they eat them green before they're really ripened. So they avoid competition. When they do this, though, they're exposed to toxins, to formal estrogen, and all kinds of nasty things. Um, when I'm in a forest, I always sample what they're eating. And more than once, I've almost eaten my nuts because the stuff is that nasty. Here, we see an Adderers Amazon, it's a subspecies of the yellow crown, eating the fruit of Spondias in their grains. And I'm going to show you multiple photos. Again, Spondias, green. These photos are all taken in the pocket. Would we have that in our grocery store? Uh, actually, this, they call it June plum. What do they call it? June plum. June plum. They are um, they're usually harvested ripe. Uh, they are grown here in Florida. They're grown for the, the West Indian uh, population. They eat them, so you can get them. Great. Well, are they any good? They're very good. They're actually, they play a key role in, in, in the rearing of many chicks of several species in the wild. What do they look like when they're ripe? Uh, they turn orange. orange. Yellow or orange, there's two types. You'll see uh, a case, uh, I'll show you some photos of Cuban conures in Cuba where there's ripe fruit and they're picking the green stuff so you can get an idea. Very few exceptions will they eat ripe fruit. But the ones they sell in the grocery store, are those going to be unripe or are they going to be... They'll sell them. Um, so most tropical fruits have very thin skin. They spoil quickly. So what, what they do is they're harvested green. That's why the mangoes, when you buy a locally grown mango, is so flavorful. And then you buy an imported mango from Peru or from Mexico and they don't really have much flavor. And the reason they don't have much flavor is they pick grain and then they're forced to buy that. It's called June plum. June plum, as in the month of June, because they ripen in June. So when we look at parents in the wild eating bananas, they don't wait for ripe bananas. They eat green bananas, and green bananas are pretty nasty. Yeah. <laughs> so if you either ripe or, or unripe, choose first. We give all our birds, uh, we, we only use ripe papaya because uh, the grove near us will only allow us to take the ripe fruit. They don't want the green because they sell the green for picklings. Uh, but I try to give stuff more vegetables and fruit. Another case, you know, there was ripe fruit down here, but the wild yellow nature of the green banana. So they avoid ripe fruit. Uh, Puerto Rican Amazon eating green guava fruit. Uh, wild uh, Mexican redhead eating what they call olive. And that's, that's here in Florida. So, I had mentioned earlier, you had asked me what does it look like in Detroit. I'll show you the next image. Coro in Cuba, again, Spolius. There's a ripe fruit there, but the little kind of is eating the grain. In fact, they will fly over trees that are ripe to select green fruit. And it doesn't matter whether it's green onions, it's green mango, it's green guava. Is, is, is that because uh, of the competition? Yes, they avoid, they evolve to avoid competition, so they eat these things. Uh, that's what we do say, toxic. How could a piece of fruit be toxic? So what happens is plants, they don't want you to eat the fruit at an unripe stage, or the survival of the plant is at risk. So the plants fill many of these seeds up with toxins to avoid being eaten when they're green. As they ripen, many of these toxins uh, dissipate. dissipate. So for example, Hura, which is a, a tropical plant that grows throughout the Amazon, is widely eaten by macaws. What is it? It's called Hura crepitans. It's an explosive. You touch on the pot, it's exploding. If you get it in your eye, it can cause blindness. The stuff will make you so sick that I've had to just go back to camp and lay for two days oh, wow. like stupid enough to try to eat. <laughs> the macaws were eating it and then they immediately went and they barked to nullify the toxins. Wait a minute. They were eating it, but they don't get sick. They don't because they bark. The bark binds with the toxic alkaloids that they then defecate. <laughs> Nature is being really incredible. So that explains why they eat all of our stuff, because they know there's no company, no competition. Correct. So exceptions. There are exceptions to parrots that eat ripe fruit, and generally it's from areas where there is virtually no water or no water. Mm. For example, the great chief parakeet, a fabulous species that's no longer uh, 
that's really just dying out in agriculture. There's one breeder that has a few. Uh, they come from a very dry area of Ecuador and Peru, so their only source of water is going to be some fruit. And even then, you know, they, they don't eat the whole thing. They'll eat a little bit of the ripe and then they go for the grain. Or, on the Villa Higedo, uh, the Socorro Kanye, there is absolutely no water on the island. None. So the bird has evolved, and the, 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 the image that I have is not real, but I have lots of them, but most of them are not clear. The bird has a very large lower mandible, and it has a very flat tongue. So it eats berries, and then it crushes them to extract the fluids. So, they eat green foods, except where there is no water, where they're forced to eat something that's right, that would have a higher moisture content. And then, many species have evolved to survive on the diet that they eat. Glossy cockatoos feed on castorina seeds. Castorina seeds are about the size of a pinhead. That cockatoo has to work 8 to 12 hours a day to satisfy itself. So when they're breeding, they can't be incubating a chick. So how does nature compensate? They produce a chick that is extremely down, that can stay warm with a little heat that it generates. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Parrots feed in trees and on the ground, and they're very adaptable. High central cause in the continent, follow cattle. The cattle eat the palm seeds. They either burp them or defecate them. So the external covering of the seed has been digested. They can't break this very hard nut. And then they find the yes. cattle poop over the cattle regurgitated them in the knee. Some species uh, have such a limited diet that they have to nest where their diet is found. Red Valley macaws, here's a pair. Here's a booty cheek palm. 90% of their diet are the seeds of this particular palm. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? They always nest very close to it. Mm -hmm. They eat the, no, it's, it's uh, booty cheek. They call it uh, moriche palm. And it is orange and extremely high in vitamin E and beta carotenes. And that's their primary diet. So they nest very close to it. Where the palm trees are, are harvested, because they make great canoes, um, the macaw populations crash. What were they called again? The, the, the palm tree, the Latin name is Mauritia flexuosa, and the, the common names in Brazil, they call it Burichi, B-U-R-I-T-I. In Venezuela, they call it Moriche, M-O-R-I-C-H-E. In Peru, they call it Aguaje. A G U A J E. So it has very it has a multitude of names depending on where you go. We see this quite commonly in Latin America where papaya has a name that changes from country to country. <laughs> it's a name that we can all understand each other. And then parents coincide their nesting with the availability of certain food. I was late last last year in, in Argentina and we were looking at Patagonian condors. They come from such a dry, dry area that they can only scrounge up grass seeds for almost the entire year. But they're constantly visiting prosopis. It's a tree that produces a pot. And when they see that that plant has flowers, they immediately start nesting. Because they know that by the time those flowers become a pot, They'll have chicks, and those pods have the fat that they require to bring their chicks forth. With Puerto Rico, it's the Sierra palm, Prostia Montana. When the Sierra palm produces, the parrots nest. So they are very, very much in touch with their environment. And then many of these foods that they eat, they have a genetic code that tells them what to do. One of the palm cockatoos that we have was captive bred. 
and it had never experienced the jungle, but it knew exactly how to harvest pandanus seeds. Blue-eyed cockatoos. We, we have a, a group of blue-eyed cockatoos. They're part of the consortium. When we got these birds, they had been hand-reared in Italy. Um, they didn't, the male didn't even recognize the female. They lived in the same cage because they were forced to, but one was not cognizant that the other one existed. So we started working with them so that he would pay attention to her and see that she was quite beautiful. <laughs> um, so we started by feeding them uh, a palm seed, a Bismarck palm that none of the other parrots liked. They immediately knew where to find the crack. They manipulated it, and then they popped it open. And then when they did that, I would take those palm seeds, we would break them open, cut them, we would drill holes in coconuts, and the food was placed inside. So it was survival of the fittest. Either they worked together as a team to eat, or they would starve. They didn't. They recognized each other, and now we are breeding them, uh, actually probably too successfully, <laughs> where we've skewed the population and the breeding consortium. So parrots are terrestrial, and primarily terrestrial species are found in Australia and in a small area of South America. They literally live on the ground. That's where their food source is. This is in Bolivia. These are red-fronted macaws. They're actually looking for peanuts in a field that has been harvested. Um, the terrestrial species tend to eat nutritionally poor foods because it's grass seeds, that kind of stuff. It's whatever is there. We are seeing a transition in some poor species in, in, in South Paraguay and Brazil, for example, where the green wing macaws are now starting to harvest spilled soybeans. But there's an interesting uh, comparison there in that the green wing macaws are no longer nesting. Infertility has gone sky high. And the biologists are beginning to think that it could be the soybeans. That these genetically modified soybeans that are produced in massive amounts and that the macaws now readily eat is the fact that it's the only, the only thing that has changed. You mean the fertility is high? Yes. To almost zero. So whereas before the population was stable, and had learned to live in this agricultural area when they brought in soybeans to construct. Where, where is this at? It's in Alto Araguaia. It's in the central, central part of Brazil. So that these soybeans are not good or are good? We don't know. This is just the beginning. Pepetea has his team there, and they're looking at this. Why? Raw soybeans have a chemical that's toxic unless they're heated or processed. Sort of like cashew nuts. Right. So all soybean products for human or animal use are heated and processed in order to denature and that. And these that are eating green. And these are eating them green because they probably have nothing else to eat. Right. Yeah, they, you see them feeding on the sides of the roads on spilled soybeans. Wait, what do you mean soybeans could be so toxic? When they're raw, what, what Susan was saying is that when soybeans are raw before they're heated or chemically treated, they're toxic. And you said something about cashews. Yeah, cashew nuts are... are I didn't are, say were processed. Yeah, they have to be, they're heated for you to eat them. So they, they have to be heated for you to eat them. Raw cashews? Yes, raw cashews. Are hard, really heated? Once they're roasted, then they're not a problem. But if, they, if it's bad or raw, that's not a good thing to get. Uh, they, they, they say they're raw because they're not, like Tony said, they're roasted, which is a different level of heating. Uh -huh. yes. They're heated enough to denature the toxin, okay. but they're not heated so much that they're fully cooked. Yeah, they're fully cooked, and then we think of them as raw because that's the only way we ever see but them. You know, if I had a, a cashew tree in my backyard, which I don't, but I could pick those and eat them. You could, you get that. Yeah, <laughs> and actually there's a pear that's attached to it. The seed is outside, 
in a capsule. So the parrots in the wild eat the fruit rather than the seed. So is it really a seed or is it really a nut? That's what we'd like to know. No clue. I think it's, you know, to me it's a seed, but I'm not an expert on that. And then parrots that feed on the ground compensate and have evolved for what's locally available. I was on the island of Antipodes in the most miserable, cold, wet place I could ever get to. I had a helicopter drop me off and said, are you sure yeah, you can land it? Are you sure you want me to, you want to stay here? Yeah, 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 I'm convinced. <laughs> Three days later, I'll see you. Yeah. It was cold, wet, windy, and miserable. <laughs> Where is it? Antipodes, it's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but in it was incredible. Yes, in New Zealand. It's one of the islands that we love. But what was incredible is that the local kakari thieves had only one thing to eat, which was dead penguins, or fish that got washed ashore, or seabirds had died. And that was their diet. That population and Antipodes had evolved to eat out. And Kias, of course, will hunt down things, um, will avidly chase sparrows and, and anything that gets into their enclosure. A few parrots, very few, gang gang cockatoos, um, Kias, and these cacarikis actively seek out protein. The others eat it casually. So if they're, if Tehura Conyers, like green cheek Conyers, uh, not green cheek itself, but some of the other members of that genus are very active explorers in the jungle, so they explore. And if they explore a tree that may have a nest of some small songbirds, they won't hesitate to eat them. Really drink yeah, yeah, and they do. It is, it is. So I had mentioned that when parrots eat toxic fruit, they bind it. So in this case, this was in India. The ringnecks were eating something that um, was very nasty. It was a purge for cattle that they would use. So they needed to eat this and then go and eat bark. They knew that by eating the bark, they could bind with the toxins and that they ate. Or, in the world's face parrot, they feed on some pretty nasty stuff and then they go ahead and eat lichens. So, um, how do we apply what's been said to captain diets? Um, I don't like to feed fruit. I do feed some fruit to my birds. I feed primarily vegetables because I think they're healthier. We feed pellets and we feed seeds. I think an all pelleted diet is boring. Um, so I want to make my birds diet interesting. We do use nuts, yes. Although we had a lot of nuts on uh, tested and actual toxins are a problem. So we often make sandwiches with day's killer bread, it's an organic bread, and you can use all kinds of butters to make it. And uh, they do very well. During the rainy season, um, for a couple of years we found that some of the cops didn't do real well when it rained and rained and rained and now we take and put probiotics on, on their sandwiches and the birds have done far better during the rainy season. What do you put on the day's killer bread? Uh, we, you can use uh, peanut butter, you can use almond butter, cashew butter, walnut. Don't you spray it with And then stuff? we buy it. So there's a guy in Thailand called Witchine in which I produce it uh, or sell a combination of oils and macadamia, almond, a hazelnut, for a cost. And it's produced in New Zealand and then it's sold out of Thailand. And it's just a good way of, uh, I'm like, I'm a bird I'm a clean freak. So it's just a way of keeping things clean. You do get the birds enriched. Can you get it here? Yeah, you can. You can. There's a company in Miami that sells it. Is that and what you posted on your site not too long ago? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, people kept asking me what it was. Now, would you do that in lieu of the nuts? Yeah, so rather than using the nuts, we would, we would use that. 
Just because we have a lot of fossils, aflatoxins in Brazil now. And that gives her enough fat in her diet? Yeah. Okay. And you can also take it, and there's many ways. You can put a pellet on a cookie sheet and you can spray it. Mm. And what is the name of this product? It's, um... Can we post it later, Linda? Do you have yeah, yeah, I can go back and look at yeah, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, oh. it used to be called black oil because it was in a black container. Got it. Um, and it's, it's which I, we can look it up on Facebook. No, you can't. It's not toasted bread. No. My dad is the bread. What's a good one? The bird. This is a, it's, it's a very, it's, it's a bread that's got 40 grains or 30 grains. It's got sprouts. Uh, it's, it's a real good quality. Uh, but it's just a way for me to reduce the risk. I travel a lot. Um, so I have to try to keep things as simple as possible because it's not fair uh, for Diane or, or, or Rosa uh, or Cindy to uh, run around and try to see if it's not good, is it good, we don't have it, the bread is easy. What is the name of that bread? It's called Dave's Killer Bread. It's expensive, it's not cheap, it's an organic bread. Um, you can buy it at Publix, you can wow. buy it at BJ's. What kind of Dave's? Because I know they have a bunch of kinds. I buy the one that's got all the grains. And, but, um, the grains doesn't have yeah. sunflower in it? Yeah, it, no, it doesn't have any sunflower. It's got yeah. walnut bits. Yeah. Dave's Killer Bread is great. I buy it for myself. Yeah, but they've got like 10 different breads. Right. So they now have a sprout one made out of sprouts. Yeah, yeah. So, so, did you find out that these nuts had um, stuff in a unit one? The what? The nuts that you need to do. We were using, we, we found that, um, I used to be on the advisory committee at, 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 um, at a, the tropical, the tropical research center. And I brought in nuts several times to have them look at them. They come out the toxins. So, in order to avoid that risk, I just said we've got to send them We do get an academia nuts. Mm -hmm. uh, Hawaii used to be a good source, but that is sort of dried out. And I'm not so trustworthy of the ones produced in Africa. Or, or so the spread fills them up the same way the nuts would. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's just a way of getting them the fat that they need. I don't have small pictures that have small pictures that have small pictures. Yeah, so we use a lot of policies, um, and we're, we're privileged here because there's so much diversity that grows here. The key thing is, is that um, in Florida, in Miami, for example, there is a raw disinfectant palm trees, and they apply a systemic fertilizer on the ground. Uh, and it's uh, not fertilizer, systemic poison on the ground. And it gets absorbed by the tree and it gets deposited in the fruit. So you have to really be careful where you're getting. We, uh, we were harvesting it from a place, and I was smart enough to tell me we've done this. Um, the company I work for, we own a lot of land, and we have a lot of palm trees that we put in uh, on the ground. Are they, are they also fertilized? Yeah. Uh, we, we use an organic uh, fertilizer on our palm trees. Um, so then we don't use any chemicals. Any I had heard extensively about aflatoxin that they yeah. like, you know, lightning and all that. And, I mean, I'm talking grueling amount of hours. And the latest I've read, supposedly cashew. Again, yep. they're not going to be in the raw form, but they are supposed to have the least amount, if any. And I found a wonderful product it's called Art Artisani Cashew Butter. It's organic. Right. It's not roasted. No sauce. You don't even have to refrigerate it. And it has a shelf life of like two years. That's a little wow. pricey. It's like eighteen dollars, but to me it was worth it. It was right. a sneak. Probiotics and little things for my bird, they wouldn't otherwise eat. Right. Uh, are cashew nuts a problem? Why are cashews nuts a problem? You could say cashews. No, she was just saying that the latest research research is showing that they are the least problematic. Yeah. You know, with Brazil nut pods, for example, the Brazil nuts grow in a, in a cannonball type ball. Yeah. These things are not commercially produced, they're harvested in the forest. So people go around and they harvest them. They're already on the ground. Where they've been exposed to, exposed to moisture and all kinds of things. So the risk is just really great. I have two questions for you. Um, as I look for enrichment wherever I can find it for my birds, I, I, I watch and like palm trees have such different nuts, and I look and I'm like, oh my god, 
God. What kind can I give them? Can I give them any? Any or all of work. The key thing is make sure that you know the history of that. Right. Where they're wrong. Yeah. Okay. Um, second question. I think you posted that you're looking at a new pellet. Are you changing? Yeah, so what we did is um, we now use Verselli Lada. Uh, they approach so. Verselli uh, Lada is used at Laurel Park. It's <laughs> their products. And they approached me and said, would you like to use the pot? And I said, absolutely. And the birds readily like it. They readily accept it. Um, we feed the smallest size available because the big size is a waste. And people say, oh, a macaw needs a big pellet. No, they, they, you know, they bite half of it, it shoots across the room, <laughs> and you're wasting half. So we find that the smallest pellet is eaten by everybody. So is there, like, how would you compare the Verselli with the Dupin? Um, we had used Supreme. Uh, we were finding problems with not enough calcium uh, during the breeding season. And it was not only us, it was many of the local breeders. So that was a real concern. We would have to be supplementing calcium to it. Um, and that, you know, when you're suddenly finding problems, it yeah. tells you there's something wrong. Is the Verselli available here? Uh, it is available. They bought Higgins and they own Golden Peace as well. Mm -hmm. So does they're that, growing. They're growing as a company in the U.S. So does that mean, is, is the Higgins food like the Verselli or they have No, you know, Higgins is just one of the, they, yeah. it's one of the companies that they own. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe the cashews are the safest because they're heated. Yeah, probably. In the Brazil, that's hard. Yeah, I'm not the shell. Oh, terrible. We were, we lost birds from that. I had somebody bring a scarlet macaw to me from Texas because they thought it had PDD, and they showed up with a big bag of mixed nuts with the <coughs> tails in the shell, and I said, that's why you bring one day. Right. Wow. Mm, it is, and you see a lot of it, for example, in India, where a lot of this stuff is very cheap. It's a huge problem. And they, their vets aren't, don't have to give. Well, there's now Rena is doing quite well, but most of their vets, you know, they're in an infancy. They're working. Yeah, where we were for years. Yeah. yeah where, wow. um, you know, they, they uh, I know a case just last week in China where a guy, bird got sick, and I said, you know, you need to take it to a vet. And he did. He took it to a poultry vet. They gave him one shot of pepper spike and then your bird's ready to go. No culture, nothing. Wow. So they are they are having to go through that learning curve. Well, the chickens don't survive with one shot of tetracycline. They weren't going to survive. Right. right. It's clearly there is a need for for you to go and do this kind of training um, worldwide. And you go to the Middle East, and they are consuming huge amounts of herbs. And in India, and in China. Uh, you know, I lecture and I do this because it's my passion. I go and live off my birds. I work for a fuel company, um, and I travel a lot for our investments, and I handle investments here in the U.S. as well. When 7,000 people show up to learn how to care for their birds, that tells you when you look at the free flying clubs that have 400, 500 participants, it just means somebody. Well, I'm not even. Like you, yes, yeah, that was a huge problem. We tried to get Susan to India, and the visa was a problem. It just, they were third world still at the time. Now it's online, it's easier. I got it three weeks back ago. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, but it's a problem. Where do you get the Oh, uh, I, it's so it's V as in Victor E. R S E L E space L A G A. It's a Belgian company. And I looked at a couple of things. I did not want GMO. Um, I try to eat uh, as healthy as possible. Um, I'm hyperactive, so I consume a lot of fat. Uh, I use olive oil and I bring it in myself from Europe because uh, I want to make sure that I know where that is organic, where it's harvested, that it's not blended with everything else. From Spain? Yeah. From yeah. You know, we have offices there. We own olive groves in Spain that we bought. So we have it uh, collected by hand. 
It's crushed in an old stone that's 2,000 years old. It was brought in by Hadrian the Emperor. Wow. So it's really good quality. It's expensive. Um, even though we, we own grows, we don't have enough, so I often buy what I, what I, what I need. So um, I looked at I don't want to use GMO stuff. I know that people say it's perfectly safe and and all this. You know, I try to eat organic as much as I can. I try to eat healthy. I'm 59 years old. Uh, I I, uh, I used to run five miles a day. I can if my knees hurt. Um, I have low body fat. I have a lot of energy. And you know, you are what you eat. So I try to to, to take that. So that's how I got for selling. I did not want food coloring. Uh, so I, I had a checklist of things that I wanted to look at. I was there to look at their facility. I wanted to make sure that they themselves produced it and that the place was clean. And I was very impressed with how clean it was. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I decided. Uh, there's one that I won't use, uh, you know, that's Harrison. I don't think the birds do well on it. Mm -hmm. I can cite many cases of breeding collections that were put on his formula, on his pellets, and production drops to zero. So, yes, that's one I would not use, and I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it for two reasons. One, because I don't believe the product is what it's supposed to be, and secondly, because he has said that he is a, a reformed bird breeder. If you're a reformed bird breeder, then why are you producing a hand rearing formula? To me, that's a concept of the time. So, you know, I'm very easy going, but I have very set ideas. <laughs> and, you know, if you want to take my money, but yet you don't like what I do, you know, that's a concept. So, what what American food do you recommend that is not really available? I think there's lots of, you know, zoo cream would be one. Um, Citrus is now available in, in the U.S. That's a very good property. What is what? And there's a history to it. What was that one? Citrus. Um, so the presentation in Orlando. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So there's lots, and you don't have to necessarily feed only pellets. You can feed, we feed a mix. Um, but just, you know, go for a checklist of things. Would it be something that you would eat? Read the list of ingredients. You know, are there coloring agents and fillers and all kinds of stuff? How do you like the JPC books? How do I what? How do you like the this Avian Rocky uh, website? Look, I have. I'm a bird reader, and I admit that. And I'm very proud to be a bird reader, but I'm a realistic bird reader. I understand that there are some problem species that um, there's a lot of aggressive male cockatoos um, and all of this. But I believe there's always a balance in the body. Um, so I'll get to you in one second. If you're going to feed this mash, you then it would breed birds on it. If birds breed on it, I know, I know you're not a breeder, but you know, so my business task would be, have you been able to breed birds on it successfully? If you have, if the birds breed, clearly they're getting what they need. A bird is not going to breed if it's dying or starving. Secondly, parrots don't eat stuff all ground up. They're very selective. They eat things in chunks. Uh, so it's fine to chop it down, cut it down to small pieces for avoid waste, but not to grind up all this stuff. Um, sprouts are a huge problem. I would love to feed sprouting food. My birds are outdoors. They are a problem with that here. Because a parrot will eat a seed and take a piece of this one. And that piece that stays there in the feet that we experience begins to decompose. And it goes back here. And three hours later, your culture plate is overblown with bacteria. So, you know, I... If people are not using birds, would that be not problematic? What I would do is I would give it, so if I were going to give something like that, I would take the dry food out at night, I would give it to them first thing in the morning, and leave it there for a couple hours, and then take out the thing. Just as a safety precaution. 
Uh, he was he was first in the like uh, we do the culture too. Yeah, yeah. That supports the money that you we buy. We do something from Battle Farm called Symbiotic, and we put out their on their peanut butter or, or almond butter or whatever sandwich they were making. We did find that during rainy season, the birds looked a lot lively. They they didn't you know because they're outdoors, and we can get days and days and days of nonstop rain. So it's called symbiotic. In symbiotic. That's why biotic. Sorry. Thank you. Um, the, well, the clay licks that they sell like at the stores that they're supposed to be off of the mounds of the clay that the parrot frogs will eat to neutralize those toxins. Are those kind of a good idea to have in our cage? Just they're great because the birds can destroy them and can enjoy them. Mm -hmm. You're not eating anything that's toxic. Yeah, it's more of a toy than anything. It is for mental well-being. <laughs> you know, um, the birds aren't, aren't eating all these toxic foods that they yeah. consume for the wild. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't need the sodium of the soil. Yeah. Um, okay. so. I have a question about the zucchini. You said that the, you're finding a problem with the calcium in it, but for a non-breeding bird. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. What about the colored ones? You don't like yeah, we not the colored I would because they selectively yeah. pick. Uh, I don't think there's there's much of a difference between the colored and the non-colored. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I always recommend the natural. Mm -hmm. Even with the Rosselli, we try, we're going to go with the natural. Mm -hmm. Which is, it's, it's got beef juice in it, so it's sort of red. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in that. You're saying it's, 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 it's not GMO. Not local. No, it's, it's okay. made in Europe. Okay. Can you order it here? Uh, yeah, they say through Higgins, mm -hmm. um, they would have it. It's the Higgins website that I might easily find. Yes, right, right from and say I would like okay. to use this spot. Okay. Okay. And the smallest one, even you know, I think in Susan, Susan, you know, birds on a pellet and unless you really be a great seed thing and can get them to eat everything. I think a bird on a pellet is not necessarily no. Oh, yeah. Well, I've been having a few years kind of and, uh, and I've had similar feelings here. Like, I question things sometimes, but I figure, well, it's better than a seed. Yeah. But still. You, you know, know are, is it worth. I don't want to feel um, great when I buy something. I want to get my money's worth. Mm -hmm. And is the money that they charge worth the problem? Mm -hmm. And you know, when we look at Tommy Gunderman's in, in Sweden, Tommy has a very large collection of black hearts. And you know, he said, hey, can you come and look? And first time for eating. There's zero production from the black hearts, and zero from the highest of the cost. And they said, absolutely. We went there. And I looked at the bird and I said, here it goes, look like crap. What do you see? He said, Harrison's and Grinch. Mm -hmm. Look at that one. Did you say Grinch? No, Harrison's Greens. Oh, the green thing. He mattered, and we changed it. And production he needed was just, mm -hmm. he was able to get four white again. And you know, a black cockatoo, or a year or four blocks, <coughs> 20,000 bucks. Mm -hmm. So she was losing significant. Um, and it may be good for pets, but from a breeder's perspective, I, I don't recommend it. I think you can get far better products. Well, you know, I'm very selective. I like, for example, I think KT, high fat, because that's more than the market. Like that. Um, there are many things that you have to select. You have to select what's good from each company. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we've gotten some of the Vercelli like our hand raised one else, we've not tried them yet. So I won't know until I try it. So I have a two-fold question. Um, you talked about the pesticides on the palm trees and how this receipt can absorb those toxins. Is Roundup in that same category? It is. Mm -hmm. It is. They will absorb it. We have seen, in fact, uh, there is a, a, an agriculturist near my house who got into an argument with a neighbor, and the neighbor sprayed her birds with blood. Oh, oh, my God. God. Oh, my God. 
So, yeah. Do you have any problems here? Oh, wait, no. Wait. So we use Roundup until no. we're harvesting. We're going to harvest those, we won't. I am sorry. Okay. And then you mentioned the part. I see you were not helpful with toxicity. Oh, okay. More specifically, uh, a soft part, a, a hard part, a pine. Uh, it would be, for example, it's oak uh, is a good one. Uh, it's one that they actively like. Uh, they will eat moringa, where moringa grows in the wild. Uh, they call it a uh, 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 breadstick tree or something like that in India. Uh, there's many trees, but generally the bark is a hard part, except. Well, Ringo has a, has a soft one. I thought, um, you know, I tried to get to Joe because there's a lot of oak around my neighborhood. I thought some, and, and I thought of, there's a lot of oak. And, yeah. But um, generally speaking, and I thought it was toxic. Generally speaking, it's oak. oak. It's, uh, the bark is fine. A lot of things that may be toxic uh, to other animals may not be a parrot. Okay, so like if I get a branch, mm -hmm. no leaves, so like that should be Yeah, or you can use leaves, branches. Oh, I do use the leaves too. Yeah, you know, just to give them part of the enrichment. The yeah. enrichment is there. Look, these parrots play a very active role in their environment. They're always moving. Now, keeping them busy is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. It's a real challenge because they're exposed to an environment that's ever changing, stresses. Um, there are, they come in contact with other species. They have they challenge each other. We now know that the family role is far more important than we thought it was. Hmm. Many of these birds um, maintain the chicks from the previous year and they go through a learning curve. And these chicks get a chance to help rear their singles. So, you know, and, and, and maybe you don't have that. Anymore. It is important to socialize. And I would say one of the greatest uh, stores that I've been to is in, is in Germany. And she forces me. If you would like to buy a parrot, you have to go to a class. That's and right. you pay for that class. You should. Sure. And that prepares you for adopting a five-year-old child that's never going to grow old. <laughs> that is, is not going to go to college. <laughs> that's very good. Yeah. And she has found that the, the number of birds ending up in second hands has dropped the virtual So tell me, we're going to have a school. I think it would be the best thing to do. Yeah, I agree. Where people, they have to go. They have to understand what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. Is it turns them away or just make them better pet owners? It makes them better pet owners because they realize that this is not, look, I have Maybe we not. sold some birds to very famous people. I won't go into names. We had one come in and says, uh, my wife would like uh, a pink parrot to match the curtains. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then it gets better. He says, we don't want it to scream because it noise bothers me. I'm a singer, so noise, high pitch noises bother me. <laughs> I don't like dirt. <laughs> and the floor is covered. <laughs> 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 You have to know what you're getting into. And, that, that, and, and if you know what you're getting into, you will be a successful paradox. <laughs> you know, you don't, and I think Susan at school would be a fantastic. Yeah, it's a brilliant idea. Where? It's going to be one school for exceptional parents. Okay. <laughs> I think that would be. And then start with the parents. Yeah. Yeah. Look, the parents are the best teachers. Yeah. Yeah. They can teach the parents how to do it. Yeah. And they can teach the parents how to do it. And they can teach the parents how to do it. And they can teach the parents how to do it. And they can teach the parents how to do it. And they can teach the parents how to do it. And they can teach the parents how to do it. And they can teach the parents how to do it. And they can teach the parents how to do it. And they can teach the parents how to do it. And they can teach the parents how to do it. You have to prepare the people. You don't just go and adopt a child. You don't go and buy a child. You have to prepare yourself for that. And I think it's analogous to that. You know, we had lots of calls. You know, I don't like a bear because, you know, my hands have one and it talk. You know, that it screams. <laughs> but if they get adopted, it's going to bite you, perhaps, or if you understand that they can become sexually active and hormonally aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, there's a problem with the internet. Everybody's an expert. Everybody's mm -hmm. posting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and uh, uh, I love it when they tell you that my cockatoos is uh, sexually advocated. What's right? Oh, give it a cardboard box. <laughs> yes, the bird sees the box in the nest, and then when you go take it, the bird attacks you. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to teach people from feeding to handling. Mm -hmm. And, 
uh, it will make a much better pet owner, a much happier bird. In, in Houston, where I live, there was really uh, pets have been there for now four years, and I was a volunteer there for their ambassador program. And what I did was on Sundays and Saturdays, sometimes other people did too. We we played with baby birds, so the potential owners could see how they act. But we also explained this is baby behavior. In a year, this baby may not be as easy to handle, or as happy to be handled, or or cool to your chest or no. So understand, it looks like a full-grown bird, but it's a baby, and it's going to grow out of some of these easy things that are happening. It's also not going to be as loud right. as it's going to get. So that was really important, and people really appreciate that. We we did more than that, but that was we. we I had so many people bring birds back because he suddenly got noisy. He was very quiet for 18 months. Now he's screaming. Well, you know, then we need to understand that parrots come in three categories. Well, there's, there's 375 parrot species, but there are birds that are blinded. You put two way more cost or two feet on the cost together, and they'll make, they'll do everything. Then there are non bonded Asiatic parakeets where when it comes time to mate, he walks up to her from the side <laughs> and he reaches over and touches her to see if she's going to pay back to him. Yeah. <laughs> and then when they mate, they don't mate from the side with comfort, they get on top. And he's ready to take off the minute she turns up. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are intermediate species. And, you know, Raynick doesn't want to be touched like a macaw or like a cockatoo all the time. So if you understand what you're getting into, I think that would be a great school for yeah. the, the all of them. Yeah, Jennifer and I are going to do it. What's up? Oh, did you, you go over the birds? Each bird needs a different Oops. diet? Uh, I, I'm going to go through it. Okay. So I'm going to go through that. Sorry about this. Okay. I know I'm, I'm deviating from it. So, you know, some superior plants can actually be harmful. Know what you're getting in. Do a little bit of research. You don't just go ahead and give your infant any milk. You don't go across the field and buy some raw cow's milk. You're going to do some research if you have a child. Do the same thing with your bird. Then we need to understand that through diet, we can affect gender. We can impact the gender of the offspring that we produce, and that will then have a consequence for pets. When you look at the number of cockatoos that are in restaurants, the majority of them are males. They are Do you see very many females or mainly males? Most So we need to work on that, and there is a possibility. And I'll show you in a second. Sometimes it's Okay. You know, where do you keep your buzz? Why birds have sores of disease? You know, make sure that they're not exposed to all these things and understand hygiene. I get very, very angry when somebody sends me a picture of a bird saying, Why are my birds breeding? There's that much crap about it. Yeah, okay, huh? When you live there, I didn't know will tell you, I am ill about plenty. When you eat out of a bowl, the dirty, and I'll show you some samples. This here, he was wondering why the birds are dying like flies from silicosis. The wild birds are getting in crap. I said, have you ever checked any of the wild birds? Oh, no, they're native. Let's check. And when he did, that was the source of his silicosis. Yeah. Or, I was a guest at a zoo. In Russia. I had the honor of being the first American to get invited to speak at a zoological center. So they showed me the zoos. I met a lot of interesting people. I saw incredible birds. So there was a pair of ring neck parrots. And they were given that bowl. And I said, you know how much they're going to eat? Well, this way they can pick what they want. I said, you understand that your mice are playing in the pool. Mice would roll around. <laughs> they couldn't figure out why they were losing bars. 
You get your bird getting things with what it will eat. You don't get a huge bowl that you can feed 30 birds for that long. Yeah. Understand the enrichment, we use coconuts and all kinds of things. And that it is key. I will go back to the white cockatoos. And this is a big smart bomb. And this is the first thing. They didn't know each other. We use food. Because they want to survive to bring them together. <laughs> and we have reared root organ macaws on just palm seeds, on foxtail palms. That's all they ever got. While they were in chicks flesh, they were burnt. <laughs> um, a couple of slides back, he says that the diet can dictate their, their sex. Yeah, I'm going to go through it. Okay. I'm going to show you how it can dictate sex. So, you know, there's lots of species. How do we apply some of these principles to agriculture? We know that large macaws have a high fat requirement. And that fat requirement varies with the strength and the size of the bee. A green wing macaw eats the hardest palm seeds in the wild. Scarlet macaw the softest. Just look at the meat. There it is. But then you eat fat. And when we look at the wild, so I've seen parrots on all continents. I've seen 80% of the parrot species in the wild. A couple areas, enteritis. I've got Black, black scars. If I would experience oh my God. Yeah, I got black spots on your body. It's from black. Oh. Um, so when we look at what they're eating, this is the fat and the protein content of what these bird species were eating in the wild. These were foods taken, brought in, and submitted for analysis. Wait, 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 can you go back? Yeah. Um, how do you go back? Yeah, we're we're back. There we go. So let me go. I uh, know the ranges are highest in leaders. Uh, Orthocytaca is the, the uh, red belly macaw, blue throated macaw, great green, uh, green wing, and then the other four birds, etc. These are lots more concerned about no birds not giving them a lot of fat. Well, it depends because they're not out roaming around. Yes. And I give them a very get chicken, but I remove the remove skin. And but I say you get nuts. You do you want to tailor the diet for the season. You don't want to give in fact this Amazon um belongs to me. And then I pass it to Howard. Um, I was in, I was doing research, and we were pulling chicks out of the nest, taking crop contents and putting them back just so we could get some idea if what we were hand rearing was right or wrong. Uh, late 1970s. And I had a trapper that was a monkey. He would climb trees, lower the chicks in seconds. He could climb the trees after the monkey. And I happened to see this unusually colored blue front fly. And I said, hey, I want that bird. Oh, no problem. <laughs> a week later, I'm at the airport, and I see the guy coming in the cardboard box. He had taken the bird, obviously, and that's sent him quarantine, and it was a lot. So I got the bird in, and I gave the bird to George Smith in England, the late George Smith. And the bird was so overweight, and he rolled across the table. <laughs> and I can I like chocolate. I can live off their job now. It's not good for So we have to provide them with what's really right, not necessarily what they like. I hear it all the time. Oh, but my bird loves the table chips. <laughs> I, have, I have one little girl on the whose name is Jelly. You know why her name is Jelly Bean? Because her diet consists of sodium jelly. Oh and Charlie, who lives with her, was fed Kentucky fried chicken. She did that way. Oh what they like and what they should get. And then when we look at Amazon, fat content, and this is the yellow face. It's not been separated from now. 
So, you know, fairly low cash, 11, 12, 12.7% of that, non breeding through breeding. I did not separate it, whether it goes through nesting or not. In captive, you know, like in, for birds in the house, where would you say the highest fat content comes from? Like, what would you say? like if we're accidentally, we have Amazon and we're overfeeding fat content, where does that usually come from? Nuts. nuts. People want to give them nuts. Oh, but they love their walnuts or they love their peanuts. You know, that's good. I, I love chocolate. I could live off of chocolate. It's not good for and how would you find out if you were overfeeding uh, fat content? When you bring your bird to Susan for the annual checkup, <laughs> she will tell you. She'll do an analysis and say, Does your bird. Doesn't lie, doesn't lie. If you're worried about that, I'm very okay. Yeah, you know, not look. I go I'm for a healthy uh, health check every year. Do I like getting a colonoscopy? No. No. <laughs> but I want to be healthy. I come from a family of very long lived people. Oh, my grandma was 95. Yes. Oh, and, and, you know, and she smoked cigars and drank rum. <laughs> and everything was cooked in lard. So if I eat healthier, I could probably exceed that by a few more years. There are lots of things I want to do. So. Yeah, yeah. You get all happy. So when we look at what they're eating in the wild, and then we look at what we feed, there are some variances, there's some deviation there. Most uh, diets, obviously, the fat content is good, um, but protein tends to be too high, and then we tend to overdo it with all the things. You don't get an Amazon and sitting in a sedentary lifestyle, not getting enough fat, or 10 peanuts a day because I like it. You know, but you said as small amounts as trees. If I gave you a pound of chocolate and you could say, well, I'm going to walk around the house cleaning this thing. I want to eat it all. Are you going to burn that many calories? No. So what you do is you consume what you know your body will be able to burn if you're going to give yourself that. What about pistachio? They're fat. You know, so trees. You don't have to give them a whole pistachio. You give them a piece of money. So, you know, Conyers tend to eat everything. You can stimulate them by doing a Spanish to feast diet. So, what you do is you put them on a very simple diet. Uh, for example, my little stress in cockatoo only get pink seed mix. Uh, in the Patagonian Conyers during winter. We want them to drop all that body fat that they accumulate sitting there. Or we want to replicate nature. These are birds that eat grass seeds. You then give them all the good stuff that you want. You have Patagonian? Hmm? You have Patagonian? Yeah. Great bird. Mm -hmm. um, so with Conyers, you do the same thing. You go from a very simple, small seed diet for 10 weeks and then you cut it overnight. And you give them lots of vegetables and lots of things high and they're immediately going to And I understand this is not, you're not really here for breed birds. You want to buy a care for birds. I just use that as an You know, right here, these are terrestrial feeders. Oh, you know, people tend to want to feed them fatty foods. How do you evolve to that? Pionis, Parallax, you understand the vitamin D, vitamin A. This isn't one thing for all, it's tailoring it with slight modifications for the species. We know that African parrots have a higher fat requirement. Um, they use, they, they, they eat the palm, uh, African oil palm. I don't believe when you look at the carbon chain of fats, because it says palm, red palm oil. It doesn't mean that that's good for everybody. Red palm oil is a very specific chain of fatty acids that is not at all like the ones that were caused to feed out of the water. It's not high in Yes, correct. 
You exactly. It's okay to be, but... It is. So you don't feed it to my cause. You know, I've seen people pour it down and just drench the food for their own cause. You know? They put the pour. And there it is. Red palm. So we have cockatoo. The diet depends on the speed. Some black cockatoo have a higher fat. All cockatoo require fat. They like nuts. I see. What would you recommend for Boston? Um, I would recommend a medium to low fat. Um, it's a great little species. I love it. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, it's, it's not as popular because it's not gaudy. Uh, even that. Yeah, they're very smart. <laughs> uh, you know, roast and cockatoo are very susceptible to fatty to tumors. Mm. Not a bird you would put on a sunflower seed diet. Mm. Paul cockatoo, uh, do you need nuts? Just keep to get them to breathe. Super interesting species. And then some like put in terror, a basically meat eater. If you give the most enticing food in a bowl, in a branch, the branch is going to get eaten first. These birds have evolved to eat these. Great species that are unfortunately not here, not in this country. Very cool. Where are they from? Uh, they come from uh, New Caledonia. And I'll use that example. That's a good case. Many rescues hate breeding. You shouldn't breed birds. There is a blush. No, excuse me. There may be an excess of a few species. There are 375 pair of species. I recently got on a, on a group that said, you breeders are all terrible. You're overloading the world. I said, I'll not give you $500 for every bread that it costs to you find in a rescue. A cold milk pair of a brown swing pair. And I went for a list of 40 species. And they were probably a few species. And they've not been managed properly. And the leader has a full responsibility for that. But it does not, it is unjust. It is like saying, and I can say this because I'm Hispanic, that all Hispanic are racists. Or oh, what? Oh, excuse me. Or Same way with this. There are some species that clearly are a problem. A brown cockatoo man. But how many rescues have red bending cockatoos? How many have a uh, great bill of parrots? Blue neck parrots? Mueller's blue back parrots? Shining parrots? Blue rump parrots? And on and on and on. Let's say that. There has been a problem with some things that we need to work on for stopping that problem. And not everything is a problem. So I think I have a quick question about that. What about blue throats? Are they endangered enough that it's... So what happens is, is that there is, they have a propensity to produce a lot of males. Mm -hmm. We were able to change that last year with the body. Mm -hmm. The species is not doing good because it comes from a coastal area. Mm -hmm. And the same coastal development that we see here in Florida, you will see along coastal mm -hmm. Many areas are just no longer suitable. And that coastal rainforest is also good for coffee and for coffee. Mm -hmm. So it's lost huge amounts of its habitat. Mm -hmm. I don't believe females should ever enter the pest. Uh, excess nails can, and they look a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. uh, they're active, they're the largest kind here. So, even within species, maybe some gender shouldn't go with that. The only color in the culture is so few lives that mm -hmm. a female should no. never enter the water. Excess nails can. Right. So, I have a suggestion for you. Um, so, I listened to your radio interview. And that list of the birds that should be bred, maybe you can hold it on. Yeah, I'm working on a list. Um, yeah. um, uh, 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 and then I've been calling a number of rescues to see what species they have. And it's 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 always the same. It's, it's a handful. Blue, gold. Yeah. Green, gold. Blue, gold. Yeah. And you mentioned um, you know, cockatiels. Um, 
they don't they don't do good on a on a fruity diet. They don't need the sugar. They can gas their yeast, they got bacteria and what do we call it here? It's a huge problem. Um, you see you go to India and they breed them in pots, in ceramic pots. And I would say that eighty percent of the cockatiels they breed end up dying. From, from gosh, simply because they feed them one millisieve, one type of milk, and that's all. We need to educate them. They pop back and go. They're not clean. They produce sickly birds. And nobody wants to produce sickly birds. And he has ceramic pots. So they look up there about that. They have a lid and they have a hole. So lovebirds, parakeets, and cockatoos are bred in these ceramic pots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Horrible. Mm-hmm. You know, lower peaks, yes, you can eat some species, and they do very well on a powder diet. Some don't do so well on a powder diet. Asiatic species, they require uh, low or high fat size, depending on the species. This was, was, by the way, was one of the toxic foods that the rainnecks were eating in India. And you know, the need for fat in some of these birds, they eat fat, they eat fat a long time. These are walnuts, and this is a kind of thing. This is a plant. I'm going to go and have some trials for that. Yes, there are several frescoes. Yeah, all the more. Yeah. Okay. It is really cool wow. to see. And it, there are, there are um, I only have one here, but there's multiple things that you can feed them. For example, one had a fig, and it had a cross to it. So what it was saying is don't feed them fig, because mm-hmm. it's too sweet. Mm-hmm. So they do that in 79 AD. Mm-hmm. We should know that today. Yeah, Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. You know, we collect this, low nutrient, fiber rich, high beta therapy. That's right. Uh, you know, you see this all the time. Yeah, the good grains. You want to talk about it, Susan? <laughs> Vitamin A deficiency and the tear ducts and everything get plugged and infected. Oh, this prone to the grains? Yeah. More than other species, but they need they need sunlight as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What is, is, do you also see it in the Amazon? No, no, no. Oh, okay. You know, just that it's it's either illness or reproduction. These are showing a little bit of love to each other. Mm-hmm. That's real common. You go to India and Pakistan, oh. where they have not figured out, and you just can't put these things on a sunflower seed diet, and that's quite common. And then, you know, we'll give it some more green dog, a pure come in, and all they have all these home-based remedies uh, that everybody's an expert on the internet. So everybody jumps in and says, oh, you need to give it boiled tea leaves, or you need to rub tea tree oil on it. Bird needs a bath. Um, the skewed saturation. So let's go over. You can produce more males or more females depending on diet. So over or underweight hens produce more female offspring. Oh. So if the female is thin, you will get more females. Hmm. Because her survival is at risk. Remember these things don't breed to make us happy. They breed so that the survival of the species is assured. Diets low in fat and protein produce more hens. Parrots that no cows or nuts, but a low fat feed diet, milk tea, fin seed, produce more hens. Flip side for that is that hens in prime condition, they are peak popular. They are receiving a peak diet, they generate hens. Because then the males have to challenge each other, and the fittest, strongest, most active male will be the one whose genes will be passed on. Do you find this is true across all? Most we have proven it. We have proven it with uh, the blue throated conures. Uh, it has worked uh, to reverse the, the, the skewed sex in spits of macaws. 
and there is a Brazilian working on Wakanoe Parish Iolis that has also been able to apply this principle to change the student saturation. It's logical, it's the same other than that way of evolution. So uh, we're going we're gonna to retry it again. Um, last year, um, I think we bred, what, about 30 boots for the kind of Diane? And whereas before we would produce two females for every 15 males, um. we produced more females and then we gave them away to breeders. I do breed birds, I get a lot of birds. Then I sold some of the golden, uh, some males to golden cock sheep. Is that where you got yours? No, I don't have a blue throat. Oh, okay. Looking at one, but is it a blue throat or a blue throat conger? I know it's a smaller blue one. Blue throat, throat, throat conger is a small, blue throat is a hawk, a big. Yes. So I'm talking about blue, blue throat is a hawk. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's a different, that's a different beast. I thought you were talking about the conger. Yeah, I yeah. know. Um, you introduce a young age. I've seen many wild parrots take food for the nest, for the chicks that fight with. Um, when possible, there are many things you can feed that grow around. You have to make sure that it's not inspired. There's no washing you can do to. Yeah. A lot of this stuff, you know, when you use. Um, a foliar spray that's absorbed in the leaves. Right. If you use a chemical at the base, it's going to get absorbed. You know, you're basically, there's a Spanish saying that you're making the tree grow. Mm -hmm. You're applying chemicals that get absorbed inside the trunk and it then get put out. Because I know I have these palm trees in my yard, but I know that they spray, so I won't feed them. Yeah, no. yeah. Avoid them. How do you feel about knowing, like around our area, what's okay for the birds and what's not? Um, what I would do is I would find out if they're spraying or not. If they're not spraying and they're not chemically treating, palm seeds are always the first cause. Uh, branches of most types of trees. Moringa is fantastic. It swirls fast and they'll eat it off. They'll even suck the juices out of the sand. No, it's a, it's a plant. It's a tree. Grow very fast. Mm -hmm. What about bottle brush? You can use bottle brush. A lot of birds don't like it being the soil. You can use the whole branch or just the end of the flower? You can use the whole branch. You can use a chunk. My birds love it. They like it. Yeah. yeah. If the birds, a lot of birds don't like it because it's oily. You know, it's, the leaves have oil, mm -hmm. so they don't like it because of that. You can use something that grows very commonly here called West Indian almond, Terminalia. You can get the leaves dry, you can get them green, you can get the seed pot. They call it West Indian almond because it looks like an almond. In fact, it tastes like a one right out here. You got it one out here. These types of leaves are dried leaves. I've seen a cactus on um, Ambon in Indonesia uh, take dried leaves over the green leaves and eat them. What about Aki? About what? Aki. Aki? Yeah, um, a red fruit. Oh, ah, yes. Yeah. Uh, I have never fed it, um, so I don't know. I try to avoid fruits. I avoid yeah. lots of things that are sweet. Okay. Is it ahi or did I say it wrong? Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's ahi is from Jamaica originally, yeah. and it's very hot. It is. Even for right. humans, you have to prepare it. And I know it has to ripen. Before you, you have to cook the toxins out too. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's very hot. Yeah, too low. So, you know, and understand that when you read that parents are eating figs in the wild, they're not eating faces and commercial things. They're eating these horrible and stupid things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, it's there. They're eating these things that grow from the bark, from the trunk. They're not a commercial thing. So when you read something that the birds are eating wild things, understand that they're not a commercial thing. They're sugar packets. And when you buy it, you're going to see fruit. Look at the sweet index. Well, I was in Siberia in there were wild apple trees. There was a whole tasting thing like chewing wood. 
<laughs> Nothing at all compared to the sugar packets of apples that we buy in the grocery store. So if you're going to see fruit, who should less sugar in your eyes? Okay, I used to breed fishes. I still have them, but I'm not breeding them right now. And they love charcoal. That they eat that in the wild because they're seed eaters, so they're picking up grit and bark and things like that from the ground. Would charcoal be good for our parents? For no, they're not, no, it's, you know, these things are getting a very different diet than they would in the wild. You know, since you brought a ring, um, you know I did curl up, I did curl up. And I was really interested about what you said about how the diet affects the gender of baby. And I kind of find that if you cut each clutch, they tend to be the same gender. And I've heard that that's because, you know, it's just sort of ensuring that they don't agree with each other. No, you're feeding the same diet. You're not varying the diet. So you're going to get a staggering production that's pretty much equal. But you know what's so funny is, like, I prepare the fresh vegetables in the morning, and they get pellets the rest of the day, kind of thing. And that all goes to all of them. But different clutches, I mean, it varies. And I don't know if I have 50 50, but it feels like overall. Yeah, yeah. When you want to play with a doctor with species that are notorious for a skewed size. And then they're all the time. Uh, they, okay. And they produce large clutches because it's a survival lifespan and short. Yeah. You know, these are little birds that uh, are produced as hawk food. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, we've got a big variety. For those of us that live here, we've got all kinds of long teeth. We've got pots. We've got lots of things that we can use for our birds. Uh, that is called guava, and it grows in Miami. You know, isn't that, that's the ones that are on the, the trees that kind of... No, these pods are... Yeah. Really, I think they're the ones on... What about the pods on... Rose Montana is a whole sort of pot. Yeah, no. Birds will eat them. They won't eat them. They won't eat them. I don't know. But how can... So, kind of back to the rabbit question, because I, I like to get birds branches of these, yeah. this, that. And so your understanding is that they absorb the toxins and then it goes into the leaves. So when it purges the leaves, would theoretically most of those toxins from that tree that had been previously sprayed now be eliminated and the next season or whatever year the, the, the new leaves? So it takes, talking to people in, in the residence, it takes about six months from application to its expiration. Meaning that if you apply it now, six months from now, the leaf will have dropped it off. I think there are enough areas that don't spray, that's not what I would know. Okay. Um, you know, like how you got other oh, favorites in Miami. Fur in Miami, I can tell you uh, we've got acres and acres and acres and acres of palm tree pandemics, et cetera. I can say go there, I'll give you a letter saying you're off and I can take as much as you want. So the roundup though is mostly a contact toxin. Yeah, like even with plants, they're saying that well, some of it gets absorbed, is what they're Yeah, saying. and it, it won't kill the plant when it hits the, the bark, but it'll it kill the plant if it hits the leaves. Right. And way back, I don't know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, people were noticing down in the Redlands that uh, dogs were getting a lot of cancer. Right. Because they were spraying the Roundup on the fence line, yeah. and then the dogs were walking a lot, running along the fence lines, chasing people that walk back and forth, and everybody just kind of like, why in the hell is this happening? Mm -hmm. And now what we know, it, it makes sense, you know, if it gets if it gets on yeah. straight on the ground, they're walking. That's why they're supposed to wear a mask and a suit, a half man suit, and they don't. And that's why a lot of dogs are getting cancer. Yeah. Uh -huh. My neighbor across the street from my house, she started fainting. And she would spray it, and the wind would get into it. She mm -hmm. took out half her, her brain. Wow. Wow. Oh. Yeah. And they, they linked it to, to the. Uh, because all the direct contact yeah. with chemicals. So what, what they're saying is that some of it still gets absorbed through the roof. Um, so, you know, yeah, percent. mostly what you want to kill are the little Right, the weeds that are growing up around it. And so any leaves that's coming up, you can use them getting killed. You can use the leaves to get killed. So you can use the leaves to get killed. So you can use the leaves to get killed. 
Yeah, there's many, many, you know, soapy water for many of these things. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, you know, commercial agriculture requires large use of chemicals. Because we have affordable food. Yeah. Good question. Um, what about like the wetland areas or state parks and stuff like that? Do you think they spray in there? Or they don't, but you've got to make sure you get permission. Okay. <laughs> you, know, you want to make sure that you see our. I'm just saying, I'm not taking the tree, I'm just taking yeah. the branch. You can't leave me tell them. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I used to go to Alita State Park, mm -hmm. and the guy there knew me, and I said, Look, I'm not taking the tree, I'm just taking some fruit from the seeds. Yeah. And they had no problem. The, uh, the pandemic. No. So you get the big cone, right. and they're as hard as a rock. What stage of that ripening cone do they like to eat? They will, I would give them to them green, because if they don't eat it green, as it begins to ripen, the seeds fall out. Just so make sure that your cave bars are not wide enough for everything to fall through. And some of the birds will they pick on a green, they'll chew on them on the edge, and they'll keep them busy. And then when the cone starts to dry, the seeds fall off. These things look like like uh, uh, looks like a pineapple. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a big pineapple around the pineapple, yeah. and these seeds just fall off. Yeah, but you have to be careful when the seeds start falling off because that center rots back yeah. inside. It grows back there, not no. And so you can just because I've got one, and I just put that off and. Or in the cage. Yeah. Huh. And the birds will chew on it, and then once they begin to fall off, they're off the stem and leave the seeds in there to play with. Thank you. Where can I buy palm, palm seeds if I don't have them in my yard? There used to be a, 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 a couple in, in Miami that used to sell them. I think it was called the Kofi Nest Pot. They're no longer around. Okay. You know, if you ever go to Miami, uh, off the Okeechobee Turnpike, the company has a lot of land. And there are 10 acres that I don't let them uh, even go in. Uh, that you can go and you know, harvest the truck over and get on the You know, so you can go there. It's not a problem. What was that? What is the food yeah. on the left again, Tony? Um, that the is long called Waba. It's a pot. Waba? Waba. G U A B is a boy A. Not guava and bee. Does Robert here sell those? <laughs> no. No. And then when, when people say, you know, we feed um, oils, or African gravy, oil palm, well, they're eating the outside. And this produces an oil called oleine. Stearine is produced in the oil. Oil mm -hmm. and oil. Big difference in the two. Big difference in, in concentration. So you don't want to add staring. You're not going to have that. You want to use the O-ring. This is the red one. <coughs> you know, pellets, as I said, are an excellent source only to avoid dietary deficiency. If you feed seeds, that's fine. Just make sure you feed other things. And it's not just giving the bird a giant bowl of seed until it tires out. Make sure that it has to eat other things. Uh, you know, you can tailor the seed mixes for the different species. In places like like Asia, you have thousands of beans available that you can select. Mm -hmm. And you can get them boiled, um, you can get them sprouted. They can be part of the diet. <coughs> Not wrong. No. Because of, of Toxic compounds and red block calcium uptake, and all kinds of things. You can either uh, boil them, soak them, and then boil them. Um, you can sprout them and then blanch them, which is what I would do. Um, why, just, why sprout and blanch? Why, why sprout? Bacteria, bacteria. Unless you really wash well. What about putting vinegar on it? Yeah, but you know. You can pull a lot of bacteria from stuff that's been washed and apple cider vinegar. What about chia? Um, great food extract. Great food extract. I can convey with culture stuff. Chia just produces this slimy mess that I worry about. I've tried every possible way to clean sprouts. And you can't. You can't do it. 
You can't do it. Well, yeah. And I produce them in large enough volume. Right. I mean, you can do it in your refrigerator for your own consumption, but. And I think we can tolerate a bacteria though, but some of these things can't. Well, we can tolerate hot chocolate that's still then. Because we yeah. fall and right. resistance to that often because we love it so much, we are willing to risk our lives right. to eat chocolate. Right. <laughs> right. You know? So, Dr. Club, what's your. Can I think I'm a spot? Sorry. <laughs> I think everybody does it. I'm sorry. I've been wanting to get into sprouting, but I do worry about the bacteria stuff, so it held me back. Is there a safe way? You don't have to explain how, but is there a safe way to do that? Or do you worry about I just that? said, yeah, I tried for years yeah. to find a safe way, and especially in bulk to feed the parrots. And I worked with places all over the world, like Tony, yeah. yeah. not like Tony, but right here. And no. All those things is one of the things. Air conditioning integration was what I wanted it's, to do today. When you sprout, you see the producing. They are a Look at a panel. You have an outside color. You eat the inside. Between that outside covering and the inside is where bacteria grow. So if it's if it's inside that covering, that seed or that bean covering, unless you remove it, you're not gonna clean that cat. So you're running the risk. And everybody says, I've been doing it for years with no problem, and then bang they have a problem and it's over. I think that might be tiny. My thing is air conditioner refrigeration and see, I'm doing small quantities. I'm yeah, I mean, you could probably manage it in a very like like this. In a small quantity, I think it would be less risky mm -hmm. than in an industrial level where Susan and I would need. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, here, for example, this Golden Condor. This was taken in Poland. University professor, nutrition. Oh, but I've used and I've never had a problem. A week after I took that photo, those birds are parents. Because the municipal water that he used, something had broken, and some unclean water got broken. You know, this is, it's common. In Europe, they do this very commonly. They sprout. The European mentality is not ours. We fuss over our birds. They are the birds I know one less. They're breeding mainly Australian parakeets. They're very hardy. They've survived generations of, of, of poor diets. They basically fed them uh, parrot mix, uh, some, uh, some spinach, and apple, and carrot. These species they've selected over. In the 1960s, they've selected these very hardy birds that would stand anything. You know. I would love to do it, we can't. It's just too risky. Yeah. And you know, if you're going to use seeds or pellets, don't put wet food in there because you're just you're increasing the moisture content in bacterial. Keep them separately. Or throw the stuff, you know, put the food in a bigger chunk and throw it inside the cage. Or on top of the cage. That's, you know, bacterial soup in the making. Mm -hmm. You know, this collection, mm -hmm. this was in Slovakia. Fabulous Amazon collection. Couldn't figure out why every two days he was taking a bird to the for bacteria problems. It's a culture here. And so the seeds would, would come in contact with the fruit. They would ferment. And problems. Can you touch on drinking water? You know, we live in the Redlands, and we go to a spring lake to treat of the water because it is so contaminated. Um, you know, water is a, is a great problem. You want to make sure it's the water is from a clean source. And everybody tells you, oh yeah, but I drink, uh, I drink well water and it doesn't kill me. Yeah, well, 
you know, the parents can eat things that will kill us, and we can eat things that will not kill us or kill them. So you can't generalize. You know, good water. And what about versus you? We got well water now. Municipal water is treated. With you know, water. municipal water has to be treated. I would still put it with filter. You know, people tell you, oh, I use RO and it's fine. Yeah. Our, our RO doesn't filter everything. We were in with World Clubs, the going through two RO systems. Well, the aquifer is contaminated. Yeah. And I saw it over the years, like from the 70s in Miami, and we were seeing the problems with the water there, with the systems that everybody used. And it all just grew back here because Pseudomonas originosa was in there. Yep. And Pseudomonas originosa loves the water, and it grows in water that produces a biofilm. Right. And it produces a biofilm with mucus and slimy stuff. Then it protects all the other bacteria that are there. And the levels get so high. And in the early days with RO, and we just put in a big RO system, so I'm happy with it right now, but we're, we're monitoring it, and I'm getting ready to culture it again. But, but I was involved with some lawsuits where clients um, had a RO system, and they were importing ostrich eggs from South Africa. And these ostrich chicks, as soon as they hatched, they hatched good and strong, and they had exercise runs and weight monitors and all this stuff, and they put in a new RO system, but the company didn't sanitize the bladder tank. And so yeah. if the water coming into RO is dirty, then the water going out of RO is dirty. <laughs> and all the time it even makes it worse because it's like a petri dish. Right. And the bacteria get there and they grow on it and grow on it and produce all these acids and then they erode through the membrane. And then it's a petri dish pouring bacteria into right. your water. The same thing with, you know, people say, oh, it's UV. And, and you know, what the UV is, it's the contact. If the stream of water is running past the UV fast enough, nothing is going to kill anything. Right. Or they'll tell you all well, using apple cider vinegar. And you know, it's. That helps, but it's not a Right, right. How about purified water? Is that any better? Or worse? You know, it's a, from a clean source. You know, not know. it's purified. Yeah. I mean, what's your definition of purified? Is, you know, still, purified water? Still water removes a lot of minerals and things. Zero. Yeah. So that's a problem. You know, make sure your water is, is, is in India. I always tell people boil your water. Because even in a hotel, I brought water samples back in and they were gross. So, so is that the solution to the boiling water? You know, they boil it because it's simple and easy. And then the other thing is, in third world nations, you see this all the time where they boil the drinking water and then they wash the dishes yeah. in tap water and they don't dry on this. They just, you know, so they're going, they're doing half the stuff. <laughs> or they believe that they pour everything, they put all these dirty uh, holes in a big tank and then pour some bleach in there, it's going to kill. Well, bleach gets nullified in the presence of organic matter. Soap water first, and then you bleach it. You know, you don't, there's no shortcut in this. And it's important to understand that. Yeah. I want to do a reading. Um, I've had issues with my birds. I mean, down to the moments over the years, clostridium, which they say everywhere, but water can be a factor. So I discovered whole foods. Um, I, I hope I'm doing the right thing, but I'd love to test it. They have like a five step triple, I mean, like they go through all these steps to purify the water. And I've been buying these five gallon jugs, hoping that that's better than. I mean, for years I was using a bird fish or thinking that that was accurate and it wasn't. Not at all. And did you smell the whole song? Well, I don't know yet. I mean, my bird fish is good. I would know enough to be able to. But what kind of testing could I do to see if it's as good as they say? I mean, if it's as good as they say, you can't prove that it's not. Right. Because they say it's the best, you can't prove it's not the best. Right. So there's no. But you believe that or you don't believe it. Right. I think a lot of it is going to be if your bird gets sick. Right. I mean, it's got to be better than a bird fish, because I'm not in a position right now to put in this several thousand dollar. You know, we as humans have evolved 
The first time I visited India, I went to Elephant Island. And as we're sitting there, I see a raw sewage uh, opening. And then pouring, they're taking water out and putting it through coffee filters and filling up regular bottle water with bottle of water. Yeah, Using crazy glue to glue the back of the, the cap on and stuff. Oh mm -hmm. I would drink that and I would end up in the hospital. Yeah. They would drink it, nothing happens to them. So a lot of it is what we do as a military doctor. I've eaten stuff. Um, um, this girl that I'm seeing and I went to Mexico. I went to eat uh, at a street vendor. Well, the hygiene wasn't that great, but you know, <laughs> I've eaten everywhere in the world. I didn't get sick. She ended up getting death. Mm -hmm. And we, in fact, we shared the same food. <laughs> Yeah. I just have a question. I know you have an incredible water pollution system, Dr. Cobb. What do you do to figure out for water? We, have, we just put in the new RO system, but when we put in the new system, we also put in a new well. Mm -hmm. And we make sure that but the well, well is clean. company, you know, cleans their equipment because some of these well servers go over the canal over there and fill up a tank with water and use that to wash to, yeah. you know, to, to uh, contaminate your well. the drill as it's, as it's drilling your well. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what's our own? Reverse osmosis. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you can use pasta, you can use many things to feed these birds. We, we try to give a lot of enrichment. Uh, these birds that they for example they're only food. These are palm seeds by the way, that's not dry droppings. Um, these are called that we drill and put food in. Force them to do what they do in the wild. To learn flocking, to learn to behave as a group. So they can tear at those coconuts? Oh yeah, no problem. It? You know, here you see them eating palm seeds. Right. Hmm. Are they, are they green coconuts when you do it or brown? Um, not green, starting. You know, yeah, brown we we avoid. You know, the aviaries. Well, now this is an old photo. Um, I am I am fanatical about hygiene. Um, then my birds are outdoors. People say, oh, but it's cold. I've seen years of cost in Russia in minus 20 degrees. <laughs> Playing outside in the snow. They have tremendous cold problems. I often laugh when. You look on the internet and some expert that's never bred anything, has never had much experience of that one type bird telling you about the temperature is going to drop to 70 degrees, you need to get a Delonghi gas heater. <laughs> or oil heater. Yeah. That can tolerate a lot. Yeah. What happens when the food falls on the ground and we got rodent problems? You, you constantly have rodent problems. This is in Brazil. That sounds like Yeah. It's still there. Really, I haven't seen it forever. It is, it is still there. It was bought by a guy, um, and the collection is deteriorated. It's become a commercial operation. But yeah. So that gives you some idea of the tropics. The food drops, they have a cement slab, it gets washed away. This is very typical in Europe, where you walk in. The problem with that is the bird can come down and eat food that's sitting there for days. It will walk across its feces. Mm. And then you can do both. This is in Moscow. And these were indoor areas where the birds could be inside in a comfortable, warm environment, freezing outside. And this is the in Moscow with bananas? Uh, no, no, this is in, this is in oh. Florida. Yeah. This is Moscow. Mm. So the birds prefer to be outside. You know, when you pressure wash, remember, you're going to spray everything. So whatever is there, you're going to aerosol. And then, you know, what do you what do you see there? Back here, a soup. You change the water. You don't, you know, this guy couldn't figure out why he's having health problems for this bird. I'm taking a rocket scientist. I'm not a veterinary culture than he is. 
I've just been around long enough to figure out that that's some of it. And all it takes is just looking a lot. There's, there's a genuine need for experience to be shared. Able culture, design, it's bounced back like never before. But we need to be able to share our knowledge. The knowledge that Susan was able to gather dealing with wild words can never be replicated again. And then she's, she's added to that by playing, by dealing with birds and captivity, by pets. You don't learn overnight. This is a commutative database. And then different people feed in. In Africa, they have a hole to reverse and fix their head for it. Nobody can change the food rules. Yeah. Automatic waters, if you have them, food can accumulate here. Make sure you put them in an angle so that they stay dry. The bird turns them, they wash. We go through extreme lengths. RO, UV, ozone, chlorination, because our water is really dirty. And it's not just mine, it's everybody around us. It's the acting first. Yeah, it is. It I is. mean, whoever thought it was a good idea to put the water that washes off in the rain on interstate bridges into deep injection. Yes. Yeah. Sure. I just thought of that. I think years ago that it was just an easy way out. Keep it easy. Yeah. Yeah. Keep easy. You get rid of it. Let, let the next person deal with it. Mm -hmm. That's what these these nuclear energy plants and the FPNL, they all do deep injection. You know, I, I work um, I work for a fuel company. And when you look at, we were in Veracruz, Mexico a number of years ago, and they were doing fracking. And we got into water development technology because of the, of, of the chemicals that come out of this fracking water. That is lethal. There was a case in Guatemala, in Mexico, where cattle, people, dogs, everything that drank that water down. Because they were pouring it into a river that people use for washing, for cooking, for drinking, the cattle pain. Well, we're destroying the environment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's, the damage can't be undone that quickly. Uh -huh. um, I think that's it. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I mean, um, I put yellow rosella in a gym day on here, and the rosella in particular will not have any kind of strike anything. They like it. So we're selling our primary uh, for Yeah, it's not great. You're going to be able to get it to be green, and I would do it on the green, holy, mix it with water, and get it back. Okay. And then Gen A time? Gen A will eat just about anything. Um, I would remove the food at night and get it vegetables in the morning. And if you use vegetables, steam some of them. Uh, that will help. And if you feed it to a warm, that helps even more. Okay. Sorry, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I have a on and um, the feeding pots. Yeah. And like, I think a lot of people like half the bowl or half the bowl. And then you set it in the red pot. And then you get more. It's not normal. They should be eating it. Um, I like tops. I think the concept is good. The pellets are just too far away. Um, you know, what I would do is, um, I would try to find a means of getting it. If you want to feed tops, maybe put it less in the food bowl, right? Um, play with them. Play with them. Rather than filling up the bowl in the morning, maybe putting in a Wait for them to eat that. Cut down the amount of food. They're smart enough to realize that if they grind it all up, yeah, I know that the sun butter is the ground up in it. I wonder if it's just like playing it. Yeah. No, it's just a pellet, the pellet crumbles easy. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a flaw with it. I did, by the way, I did bring um, some of the books in Cineculture. Uh, I don't make anything off these books. Uh, they are donated, uh, the, the profit is donated to conservation projects. Uh, I don't have a lot because they've sold out. Um, how many do you have? 
Uh, Diane, how many do we have? I, mean, I'm I think there's like four set of culture and ten macaw books or something. I just want to want the copy of my book. Yes. Anyone can have one. I have some. That's a great book, by the way. I reference it repeatedly because it was novel. It broke new ground. Um, and it's got a lot of information. Uh, I was able to get a couple of copies in Florida. And I took several of them for that, and I think it was gladly. I tried to give them to the ARMS to study for the board committee. I didn't love it. It's really sad because there was just such a disconnect between native culture and veterinary medicine to the point where I kind of feel almost ostracized mm -hmm. because of the anti cinema. Yeah. And I think. As we start to keep birds like the bird photos with like Moonlight School and can be yeah. like him, I then, think that, then that's going to change the whole thing for veterinarians because they, they, they can't make money treating birds, you know, they make a lot of money treating dogs because it's always like that. Right. And, and a golden kind of can be like that. I agree. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a huge they, movement. Not yeah. just the veterinarians, the young people feel have a right. stigma against breeders. No, well, that's not what our colleagues feel. I, I understand that. It's a fact. It's a fact. And that's why I was asking you because I got into people and I'm like, oh, we don't need more birds. You brought that up. And I'm like, well, I'm trying to. You know, when I would ask for they said, we don't need more birds, I would say, okay, I will give you $500 for every. Right. Dusty parrot you find, every great bill, every broomnake, every viewer, and there's a list on my wall.